Carry on. Now, Professor Herrick, I'd like to turn to the development and origins of sexual orientation. Now, because the term homosexuality encompasses many distinct phenomena, attempting to identify the origins of homosexuality and, more broadly, sexual orientation is a difficult task, correct? Uh, what, what, what I've said in my, uh, my expert report and elsewhere is that there are many different theories about the origins of sexual orientation in general, not just homosexuality, but also heterosexuality. Uh, and there really is no consensus on what the origins are of a person's sexual orientation. All right. Please turn to tab five in the witness binder, if you would. Sorry? Please turn to tab five in the oh, witness binder. Oh, so this is back in the old, the bigger one? It is. Okay. And uh, please look at page 151 in the second column. And uh, please look under origins in the bottom of the first paragraph. Yes. And you're speaking about homosexuality. You say, because the term encompasses many distinct phenomena, however, attempting to identify the origins of homosexuality and more broadly sexual orientation is a difficult task. Correct? Yes, yes. All right, thank you. And, and those are your words? Correct. Thank you. All right, the factors that cause an individual to become heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual are not currently well understood, correct? Um, that is correct. Thank you. And the origins of sexual orientation, why a particular person becomes heterosexual or gay or lesbian or bisexual, is an area where there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of dispute, correct? That's correct. No compelling evidence has yet been offered to demonstrate clearly the origins of adult sexuality, correct? That is correct. Widely differing sources for adult sexual orientation have been proposed, but no single theory enjoys unequivocal empirical support, correct? No single theory enjoys unequivocal empirical support, correct? That is correct. Thank you. <clears throat> It seems likely that a wide variety of biological, psychological, social, and cultural variables that contribute to sexual orientation will eventually be identified with different individuals arriving at their adult orientation in different ways, correct? That's my speculation, and I believe it's accurate, but it is my speculation. All right, thank you. And so that, is that your opinion? Well, it's, it's, it's my hypothesis, I guess I would say. Uh, subject to revision in the, in the light of different data, but at the moment, yes, I would say that that's my opinion. Right, based on the data currently available, is that? Correct. Okay, thank you. Debates about the origins of sexual orientation have led to a more pluralistic view of human sexuality, correct? Um, I, are, are those my words that you're reading? They to? are. They, where they, just can you tell it's, me where they're from so I have a context for it? It's tab six, if you'd okay. like. Okay. And it's page 686. Okay. Oh, under the origins of sexual orientation? Right. This is from the Corsini Encyclopedia article, right? Correct. Okay. So do you agree with that statement? Debates about the origins of sexual orientation have led to a more pluralistic view of human sexuality? Debates about the origins of sexual orientation have led to a more pluralistic view of human sexuality. Yeah, I'm just trying to find where you're reading from. I'm sorry. Can you tell, point to me, point me to the place on the page, or just which column or which paragraph? Second column, uh, the second full paragraph. Right. Can you find that? Um, oh, the second full paragraph. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I see it now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Scientists are increasingly coming to appreciate that homosexuality and heterosexuality are not unitary phenomena and that even in our own culture, different people develop and express their sexual orientation in different ways, correct? Yes. Based on these insights, no single theory seems likely to be able to explain the development of heterosexuality or homosexuality in all people, correct? Correct. 
indeed some that, days that is my speculation I, I mean I'm, I'm saying that but okay, I, I believe you. it's accurate indeed some researchers have emphasized this view by framing their work in terms of heterosexualities and homosexualities correct right and those those have been mainly ways of trying to identify this uh, diversity within those groups uh, along the lines of some of what we discussed earlier differences in age, race and ethnicity, location, uh, all sorts of things that contribute to differences in experiences of one's sexuality. All right, thank you. And in this specific context uh, where you're talking about the origins, I, I assume you're talking about a variety of potential causes as well, correct? Well, I, I do posit that. I think that by the time we got to that last section of that paragraph, I was just pointing out that um, uh, in studying, in, in not coming up with a single explanation for what causes an individual to have a particular sexual orientation. This was generating lots of other questions as well about sexual orientation and those questions were pointing to uh, variations within the population of heterosexual people and the population of homosexual people. And so I believe that was where I was going with that uh, comment about uh, increasing pluralism or leading to a more pluralistic view. All right, thank you. So people arrive at a homosexual identity through various routes, correct? Well, that's my speculation, but I believe it's probably true. Right, thank you. Some individuals, for example, identify as gay only after multiple homosexual experiences, whereas others form a gay identity without having engaged in homosexual behaviors, correct? That's correct. Some women develop a lesbian identity primarily on the basis of feminist political values rather than erotic attractions, correct? Well, that's a statement that I believe was accurate at the time that I wrote this. Uh, I think that that phenomenon, which is sometimes referred to as the political lesbian, uh, a woman who uh, identifies as a lesbian through a sense of political uh, solidarity with uh, lesbians and as an embracing of a feminist ideology, um, I believe that that was much more common in the 1970s and perhaps in the 1980s than it is today. Um, it probably still does occur, but I don't think it's uh, as widespread as it, as it might have once been. But is it a true statement for some women? Well, it was at the time that I wrote this, and I would imagine that there are still some women today who would identify themselves as political lesbians. Why do you believe that's less common today than it was 20, 30 years ago? Well, I'm not sure, Your Honor, but I would just say that I, uh, in, in a way it's almost because of the absence of seeing a lot of... Uh, uh, research on those sorts of women. Um, so it, at, at one point, um, that concept, it, it showed up in a number of places in different research studies or descriptions of um, especially lesbian communities. And um, I just haven't seen it as much uh, in, in recent times as, it, as, it, as was the case in those earlier times. So that's, my, that's the basis for my speculation that it may not be as common as it once was. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. There is increasing evidence from the research that has been done looking at samples, probability samples of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, that it may very well be the case that this is a population that tends to have a higher educational level on average than heterosexuals, correct? Um, is this from the same passage? No, this is from your deposition transcript. Oh, okay, okay, good. I was just getting lost. Um, yeah, it, it may very well be the case that on average um, lesbians and gay men in the United States have a higher educational level than comparable heterosexual men and women. Now, you, you don't know that we have a really clear understanding of this correlation with education, correct? Uh, correct. There are reasons that we can speculate. For example, um, it seems likely that many women who marry heterosexually may leave school, uh, leave college, or not go to college at all in order to do so. Um, lesbians are less likely to encounter the situation where a relationship would mean that they uh, had to uh, leave school, move to another part of the country to be with their, their partner, uh, th those sorts of things. So that's at least one plausible explanation why we might see uh, higher educational levels among lesbians than among uh, heterosexual women. It's also possible that we might see higher levels of education among gay men for a somewhat similar reason in that they perhaps are not likely to get married at an early age and 
at, at an age where they might have to stop going to school in order to take a full-time job or more than one full-time job to support a family. Those are speculations about why there might be that educational discrepancy. Okay, so those are speculations, correct? Correct. But we don't really have a clear understanding of the correlation, correct? Well, I'm, I'm not aware of other data that would exist uh, to explain that. But, but the correlation does seem to be a difference that has emerged in a number of different studies, so it seems to be a real difference, correct? The educational? Well, it, 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 may, it may very well be a real difference. I believe in, in my uh, study, for example, we found uh, higher educational levels than would be expected from comparable heterosexuals uh, among lesbians and gay men. Um, so it, it seems like it may very well be a real difference, yes. All right, thank you. Please turn to tab 35E in the witness binder. Volume 2, right? Volume 2. And uh, this is a transcript of the proceedings in this court in this trial on January 12th. And this was testimony given by Professor Cott. And are you familiar with Professor Nancy Cott, uh, Professor um, Eric? I'm not directly familiar with her. I have some sense of who she is. Right, thank you. You'll see on the page I've reproduced of the trial transcript, on page 328, line 6, she is asked, do you believe that behavior is really infinitely malleable by social circumstances and by culture? And she answers, just about infinitely, yes. Do you agree with that statement? That behavior is infinitely malleable by social circumstances and by culture? Well, she qualifies it with just about infinitely. About infinitely. Uh, how do you be just about infinitely? Well, you can, uh, you can go on. The, the question after that is with the sole exception of self-preservation. And she says, I think you have to accept that, yes. So that appears to me to be her qualification. Well, you know, behavior is certainly a very broad uh, topic and to say that all aspects of behavior are malleable by social circumstances and by culture, um, I would be, I personally would want to think about that one for a while before I would say uh, yes or no. I, it, it seems like it's such an all-encompassing statement uh, and this isn't really something that I have thought about in these terms. All right. Uh, as you sit here now, if you're not able to say yes or no, are you able to say whether this you believe that's an unreasonable statement? Well, I would assume that Professor Cott had a reason for making it. I, I just would say that if, if you're asking me if I agree with that statement, I uh, would have to think about it for a while. Fair enough. Thank you. Please turn to tab 10 in the witness binder. Again, this is the, the big one. I thought we were done with the big one. Uh -huh. I'm trying to do this topically, Your Honor, so I'm having to refer back occasionally to... Okay. And this is the... Uh, the article I haven't seen before. Yes, this is by Professor Badgett. It's the... And we've looked at it before, as you said. Please turn to page 23. And the paragraph that's in the middle of that page, it's the second full paragraph. She writes, further complicating matters, sexual behavior and sexual identities might also be related in some ways, in some way, to economic outcomes or to an individual's socioeconomic class background. From a rational choice perspective, a la Richard Posner, 1992, the choice of a same-sex partner is an outcome determined by individual preferences and budget constraints. According to Posner, factors like high income that reduce search costs for sexual partners will increase homosexual sex for men. Do you believe that it's possible that Judge Posner's theory is correct? Um, I actually don't think I understand Judge Posner's theory on the basis of just that, that sentence. Okay, as described here... Is he saying that um, men who have uh, strong attractions to other men if they have a high level of income, um, might be able to have more sexual partners because that income allows them to travel to places where they might meet more partners or do other things that might let them come into contact with more men who are potential partners? Is that, is that what he's saying? 
But with what she wrote here is what it just is on the page. It says, from a rational choice perspective, Ella Richard Posner, the choice of a same-sex partner is an outcome determined by individual preferences and budget constraints. According to Posner, factors like high incomes that reduce search costs for sexual partners will increase homosexual sex for men. As written, are you, is your, are you essentially unable to understand that? Is that your testimony? I, I wouldn't be comfortable commenting on it without understanding exactly what uh, Richard right. Posner is saying here. Okay. Then she goes on to say, a more sociological model of behavior that involves sexual scripts and social networks could have a similar implication. A family's economic status might influence the scripts and networks that individuals eventually operate within. An openness to homosexuality might vary by economic class or other norms correlated with family background. Do you believe that it's possible that that the theory described there is correct? Well, um, yeah, I think it, if I'm reading this correctly, in the next sentence she's talking about that correlation of, uh, or the, the fact that um, it appears that um, in the Laman et al. study that uh, it was the more educated women and men who were more likely to have had same-sex partners and to identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Um, so, I mean, one possibility is that um, uh, having the higher education leads one to uh, identify or, or have more sexual partners of the same sex. The other possibility is the one that I was suggesting a moment ago, which is that perhaps people who are lesbian or gay and perhaps bisexual um, are more likely to pursue a longer term of education. Um, I think we have a correlation here, and, and a correlation is inherently a relationship in which we cannot determine the causal direction uh, w without further research. So that could be correct. This spec this theory as well is the one you posited. Is that um, what you're saying? The one that's posited here on, in the Badgett paper or the one that I posited? The one posited in the Badgett paper. Um, I. I guess that it, it is stated as a hypothesis that could be tested. And could it be correct? Do you, do you have any reason as you sit here th today to say that it, you believe that could not be correct? Well, you know, again, as as you sit here today, do you have any reason to believe that that statement is not, could not be correct? Well, as I sit here today, I have to reiterate that I haven't read this article, and so I'm very reluctant to evaluate a particular sentence that's been pulled out of it this way without having the benefit of understanding the context in which Professor Badgett was offering this hypothesis. So I, I would just say I can't really say whether it's plausible or not. It, it, it may be, uh, but uh, I would really need to have read the entire article to understand exactly what this means. You know, I, I would say also this looks to me like an economist's argument, and I'm not an economist. Uh, so I would have to, uh, it, it would be a challenge, I, I suspect, for me to, uh, to fully understand this, especially off the cuff like this. Right, and, and you read the next sentence that says, the finding by Laumann that more educated women and men are more likely to have had same-sex partners and to identify as LGB could fit either theory. And that's I guess referring to the Richard Posner theory and this sociological theory, correct? I believe that's what she's saying. Yeah. All right, thank you. Please turn to tab 29 in the witness binder. The big one. Um. So this is back at the Garnets and Peplau article Correct. again? Okay. Correct. Thank you. And we, as you point out, we've looked at this. And let's uh, turn to the bullet points on page four. And the fourth bullet point says, women's sexual orientation is shaped by such social and cultural factors as women's education, social status and power, economic opportunities and attitudes about women's roles. Do you agree with that statement? Um, well, again, this is another article that I haven't read, uh, and it's a very brief one as well. 
Uh, I would, before commenting on that statement, I would want to uh, read it in more detail and, and be sure that I understood um, what research they're, they're basing that particular statement on. Um, so, for example, the, the idea that women's sexual orientation is shaped by such social and cultural factors as women's education, I'm not sure if they're talking about that correlation between um, uh, sexual orientation and level uh, length of education, or if they're talking about some other aspects of education. Um, so, so again, it, it's one that I just really would have trouble commenting on without having read something that, that elaborated upon this research. So, um, so as you sit here, you're not able to say whether you agree with that statement or not? Is that uh, yeah, I, I guess I would say that. It may, it may be partly the hour, but I'm finding that I'm having, uh, I, I would need to uh, look at this more and, and ideally look at it in a, in a context where they're citing some of the research studies they're talking about. All right, thank you. And look at the last bullet point underneath it. It says, there is no single developmental pathway leading to a heterosexual, bisexual, or lesbian outcome. Do you agree with that statement? Well, as I said earlier, I think that it's very likely that um, we will discover that people have multiple developmental pathways to their adult sexual orientation. So this is certainly consistent with uh, that hypothesis of my own. Okay, thank you. Please turn to tab 30. And again, this is an article by Professor Peplau. Yes. Look at, please look at page 12, if you would. In the uh, first column, towards the top of the page, I believe it's the first, call, first full paragraph, she writes, in summary, the concept of erotic plasticity is a cornerstone of a new paradigm for understanding women's sexual orientation. Women's sexuality is not tightly scripted by genetic or hormonal, or hormonal ah, excuse me, lateness hour for me to, or hormonal influences. Rather, it is responsive throughout the lifespan to a wide variety of cognitive, social, and environmental influences. Do you agree that women's sexuality is not tightly scripted by genetic or hormonal influences? Well, I believe that this needs to be read in comparison to men's sexuality, which I. I'm guessing, again, I haven't read this article either, but uh, I'm guessing that, that Professor Peplau is offering that contrast, um, as she has in some other papers, uh, and pointing out that, um, as researchers have found, women's sexuality defined broadly, not only in terms of sexual orientation, but in many other aspects, does seem to be more uh, responsive to situational and environmental uh, factors than is the case for men's sexuality. So, um, uh, you know, I would say that if you're thinking of it in that comparison uh, between men and women, that this notion of erotic plasticity, um, which again is broadly defined, is a more applicable notion to men, I'm sorry, to women than to men. Uh, I believe that that is, that is accurate uh, based on the research that we have to date. Right, and, and she speaks specifically of erotic plasticity as a new paradigm for understanding women's sexual orientation, not just sexuality more broadly understood, correct? Well, the erotic plasticity concept is about sexuality broadly understood, and I believe she says this is the cornerstone of a new paradigm for understanding women's sexual orientation. All right, thank you. Now, she goes on, as you'll see, she talks about a variety of, she talks about the variety and nature of women's romantic and sexual relationships. And then at the bottom of page 13 in the first column, she says, one implication of this research is that the very concept of sexual orientation may be misguided. Do you think there's any chance that that could be correct? Well, you know, again, I haven't read this paper before, so I'm very reluctant to evaluate sentences taken out of context. I would say in some of her other work, Professor Peplau has focused on that word sexual orientation and has pointed to the concept that I was talking about at the beginning of the day of sexual orientation being very much a relational construct. And so it may very well be the case that in this article where she's going with this is to say, the focus on sexuality is perhaps 
something that works better when you're trying to understand men's experiences than women's. And when you're looking at women's experiences, it might be better to take this construct of sexual orientation and understand it in terms of relationships. Uh, and, and that might be a more helpful view. And, and I believe what she's trying to do here and, and in some of her other papers is to offer an alternative way of thinking about sexuality that might be useful to researchers. All right, thank you. And please turn to tab 15. Again, this is by Professor Peplow. And we've, in the big, one. In the big yeah. book. And we've looked at this before. And please turn to page 81. And on page 81, I'd like you to look at the bottom of the first full paragraph. And she writes, quote, available evidence indicates that biological contributions to the development of sexual orientation in women are minimal. Do you agree with that statement? Well, as she says at the beginning of the paragraph, more than 50 years of research has failed to demonstrate that biological factors are a major influence in the development of women's sexual orientation. Um, and I would say that we also can say that to some extent about the development of men's sexual orientation. Um, as I said before, uh, uh, we don't really understand the origins of sexual orientation in men or in women. Uh, there are many different competing theories, some biologically based, others based more on culture and uh, individual experience. And uh, so I would say that what she's suggesting is that um, the available evidence um, doesn't support the idea of uh, there being a strong biological factor that uh, explains the development of sexual orientation in women. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, I would agree that that is the case. And I would also say that I don't, I, I believe that it's the case that we simply don't understand the origins of sexual orientation in either men or women. Please turn to page 87 of the same document. And under an alternative perspective, that heading, do you see that towards the bottom of the page on page 87? Yes. She writes, a comprehensive analysis of women's sexual orientation should begin with empirically grounded generalizations about women's experiences. The cumulative record of research on women's sexual orientation supports three broad conclusions. First, there is no inevitable association between masculinity, variously defined, and women's sexual orientation. Associations may exist in particular cultural contexts, but are not a necessary component of sexual orientation. Second, the impact of biological factors in determining women's sexual orientation appears to be weak or non-existent. Third, cross-cultural and historical analyses demonstrate that women's erotic and romantic bonds can take diverse forms that are shaped by their social environment. Do you disagree with any of those conclusions? Um. Well, we just discussed the second one about the biological factors. And as I was saying, there, there, the evidence there is, I, I'm, frankly, some people would not say it's weak, but it, it is certainly not conclusive at all. Um, Do you believe, and, oh, sorry. That, uh, I'm just looking at the, at the three statements again. Um, and the idea that women's erotic and romantic bonds um, can be affected by their social environment, yes, I think, We've already talked about that. So yes, I would say that I, I would agree with these statements. OK, thank you. And, and please turn to page 92, Oops. same document. The authors write, quote, in the, United, in the US, Ganya, 1990, suggested that the creation of visible urban gay and lesbian communities made the choice of a same-sex lifestyle more attractive to wider audiences. I'm sorry, where are you? Oh, I see. Okay, I yeah. found you. Okay. And then there's a quote, which you, you can read if you'd like, but I'm going to move to right after that. After the quote, they say, Ganyan suggested that one consequence may be to increase the demographic and personality diversity of those participating in same-sex relations. Uh, do you believe the creation of visible urban gay and lesbian communities may have had this effect?
Well, I, you know, and I'll say it yet again. This is another paper that if I, I believe I may have read it in the past, but not recently. Um, I believe that what Gagnon might have been saying here is that there may be individuals who uh, have uh, same-sex desires uh, and attractions and perhaps even uh, engage in same-sex sexual behavior on occasion. But in the time before the emergence of visible gay communities in cities may not have even known that there was a label to describe people like themselves and may not have known that this was uh, uh, that there really was such a thing as sexual orientation or that it was possible to be gay. And so I would speculate, and I am speculating because I haven't read this, uh, that perhaps Professor Gagnon was saying that for those sorts of individuals, the existence of uh, visible gay communities would uh, allow those sorts of individuals to realize that there were other people like them and that it might be possible to um, uh, find those other people and develop a community with them. Okay, thank you. Please turn to page. Please turn to tab 14, if you would. And again, this is another article by Professor Peplau that we've looked at. How are we doing, Mr. Nielsen? We're getting there, Your Honor. That? We're getting there, Your Honor. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Which tab again? Uh, it's page. It's tab 14. Okay. And please turn to page 332. And you'll find in bold a heading, The Fluidity of Women's Sexuality and an Italics, uh, Influence of the Social Environment. And under that, in that last paragraph, you'll find partway down, it says, Consider the link between education and sexual orientation. The National Health and Social Life Survey which again is the Lauman survey that we've discussed, found that completing college doubled the likelihood that a man identified as gay or bisexual but was associated with a 900% increase in the percentage of women identifying as lesbian or bisexual. Are you familiar with those statistics? Um, well, not with the specific statistics, but this gets back to the correlation we've been discussing, uh, which indicates that lesbians and gay men are likely to uh, have had more years of education than comparable heterosexuals. Right, thank you. And, and please turn to page 336. And the very first sentence on the page, under the heading Social Cultural Influences on Women's Sexual Orientation, reads, there is mounting research evidence that the patterning of women's sexuality and sexual orientation varies across time and place. Do you agree with that? Taking a moment to read the paragraph. Well, again, I, I think this is something we've already discussed in that she's talking about uh, different cultures, but also even within our own culture, different racial and ethnic groups, uh, socioeconomic groups, having uh, all of the experience of being in those different groups having an effect on one's uh, sexuality and, and how one understands oneself as a sexual being. So uh, I, I would agree with it in that sense. All right, thank you. And please turn to page 337 in the second full paragraph. Professor Peplau writes, as another example, living in same-sex institutions also tends to increase the likelihood of romantic and erotic relationships between women. Do you agree with that statement? Well, as she points out, um, there was a 1929 study of graduates of women's colleges who, in which women reported that they'd had an intense emotional relationship with another woman in college. And she also talks about uh, same-sex relationships occurring in prison populations, which are um, sex-segregated. Um, so it may very well be the case that uh, in those particular settings, people are more likely to engage in same-sex behavior and possibly to form uh, bonds that are based on that sort of behavior. Right. Thank you. And please turn. 
Please turn to tab 36 in the little binder. Can you identify this document, Professor Eric? Not yet. Um, this is an article that was published in the Journal of Gay and Lesbian Mental Health in 2008 titled Masculinity, Femininity, and the Development of Sexual Orientation in Women. The authors are Letitia Ann Peplau and Mark Huppen. Right, thank you. And can you turn to page 156? And I believe this discusses the survey that you referenced there. Page 156. 156, yes. And towards the bottom of the par carryover paragraph, it reads, during the same time period. Right, and this is referring back to the same thing that was mentioned in the other article that we just right. finished. And she found that 42% of the sample well, it was, during the same time period, American researcher Catherine Davis, 1929, mailed a questionnaire about sexuality to 2,200 graduates of women's colleges in the United States. The questionnaire asked, have you at any time experienced intense emotional relations with other women? 42% of the sample replied that they had. Of these 52% said that the relationship was sexual in character. In other, in other words, one woman in five reported a sexual relationship with a best woman friend in college. Although some of these women continued to have intimate relationships with women after college, most did not. And uh, you're familiar with that study, correct? Um, the 1929 study by Catherine Davis? Yes. I haven't read it. I have, I have run across references to it. OK. Thank you. I, Your Honor, I'd like to offer DIX 1237 into evidence. Very well, 1237 is admitted. Okay, thank you. Please turn to tab 37 in the witness binder. Can you uh, identify this document? It'll, it's pre-marked DIX 1254. This is a document from the journal, I believe it's health, the journal is Health and Human Rights. Um, the document is a commentary titled Torture and Ill Treatment Based on Sexual Identity, colon, The Roles and Responsibilities of Health Professionals and Their Institutions. The authors are Simon Lewin and Ilan Meyer. Okay, thank you. And you're are you familiar with uh, the authors? I don't know who Simon Lewin is. I'm familiar with Ilan Meyer. I've never seen this article before. Thank you. Please turn to page 163. In the bottom paragraph, partway through the paragraph, it says, although human rights work requires the identification of a person as a subject of rights, social science research has suggested that sexual identities are socially constructed. Do you agree with that statement? Well, let, let's take the second half. Do you agree with the statement that social science research has suggested that sexual identities are socially constructed? That certainly has been suggested. Do you think that's an unreasonable suggestion? Well, as I said earlier, I think that you have to look at the social constructionist perspective from the group standpoint. And in that regard, if it points you to looking at cultural influences and cultural variation, that's a very useful perspective. I don't believe that the social constructionist perspective works very well when you try to apply it to the specific experiences of individuals. Now, as far as this statement goes, um, I'm not, as I said, I've not seen this article before, so I don't understand the context in which they're making this statement, um, except that they seem to be talking about the fact that, uh, and I'm guessing this, that, that people uh, who are lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and perhaps transgender as well, uh, face oppression and even torture in some societies in some countries uh, and I'm guessing that the authors think that's bad but I don't know the uh, the context in which this particular statement was being made 
right, thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to offer DIX 1254. All right, thank oh. you. All right, P Professor uh, Herrick, please turn to, pay, to tab 38 in the witness binder where you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 1278. Can you identify that document? Well, it's a reprint of a web page, it appears to be, from the American Psychiatric Association. The title on it is Healthy Minds, Healthy Lives. Thank you. And if you turn to the first page of the printout after you have the addresses, under gay, lesbians, bisexuals, and under what causes homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, partway through that sentence, partway through the paragraph, you find a sentence that reads, however, to date, there are no replicated scientific studies supporting any specific biological ideology for homosexuality. And you agree with that, correct? Well, I would say that I am not sufficiently familiar with the research literature to say that there are absolutely no replicated biological studies. But I would agree with the statement at the beginning of that paragraph, which says, no one knows what causes heterosexuality, homosexuality, or bisexuality. Right. And are you aware of any replicated scientific studies that do support a specific biological ideology for homosexuality? Well, um, I, I have a sense that there might be some, but uh, I, this is not something I you know, prepared for in terms of coming today. But um, I, as I said, I would certainly agree with the statement that we don't know what the origins are of sexual orientation. Okay, thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to offer DIX 1278 into evidence. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you, Brian. No objection. Very well. 1278 is in. All right. Let's turn to tab 41. I'm going to skip a little bit here. And uh, you'll find a document pre-marked DIX 642. Can you identify that? Um, I'm going to mispronounce the names. Um, the first author is uh, A.F., I'm guessing it's pronounced Yorm, J-O-R-M, uh, and there are several other authors. This, the title of this is Cohort Differences, or I'm sorry, Cohort Difference in Sexual Orientation, colon, results from a large age-stratified population sample. Um, this appears to have been published in the journal Gerontology, in 2003, uh, and these authors are uh, in, located in Australia. All right, thank you. Now, this study found that women in recent birth cohorts in the United States, Britain, and Australia were more likely to report having a female sexual partner during adulthood, and you'll see that on 392 and 393 if you look at the introduction. And on page 393... Excuse me. I'm uh, sorry. Now, again, I, this is not a paper I've reviewed. When it says they were more likely to report having a female sexual partner during adulthood, um, more likely than what or whom? Uh, older age cohorts. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. All right. And if you look at the third, well, the second full paragraph on three, 393 in the... Uh, they, they, the authors conclude, these findings suggest a major cohort effect in same-gender sexual behavior and perhaps also in sexual orientation. If a cohort effect in sexual orientation exists, it has implications for purely biological theories of sexual orientation because there must be historical changes in environmental factors that account for such an effect. Do you believe that's an unreasonable conclusion? I believe that's a hypothesis one could make. I would offer an alternative hypothesis. Just if I were sitting down to read this article, the first thing that would come to my mind is that people who grew up in the 1920s and 1930s and uh, the early part of the 20th century 
would have been growing up in a time where there was very strong repression against people who were lesbian or gay. And in fact, when there wasn't much open discussion of sexuality at all. And so uh, I would say that it would be a reasonable hypothesis to say that these age cohort effects might be due to the differing levels of stigma experienced by people in different age cohorts, such that older people might be extremely reluctant to disclose a same-sex attraction or homosexual behavior or being lesbian, gay, or bisexual than would people in newer cohorts, more recent cohorts. You believe that, okay, so that's an alternative hypothesis. Do you believe that the hypothesis suggested by the authors is unreasonable? Well, I assume that they're going to test it, um, although, I, again, I haven't read this article. So it's not an unreasonable hypothesis to pose. And for all I know, again, not having read this article, uh, sometimes authors pose a hypothesis that they actually expect to disprove in the course of the study. That may be the case here. I, I just don't know because I haven't read the paper. All right. Your Honor, I'd like to offer DIX 642. 642 is it. All right. Thank you. Now, you mentioned in your direct testimony the Williams Institute study about uh, a survey of same-sex couples in Massachusetts, correct? Well, the Williams Institute, I believe, researchers from there wrote the report. I believe it was carried out by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. All right, thank you. Now, apart from that, all of the studies that you relied on in finding that marriage had physical and mental health benefits, in all of those studies, marriage referred to legal marriage recognized by the state, correct? Um, Yeah, I, I, I'm just pausing because I, I believe that in many cases they simply asked people if they were married. I'm not sure that they provided that sort of definition to the respondents. They simply asked them their marital status. But that would be implicit in it, yes. Right. And in all the studies on which you relied, this has always been heterosexual marriage, correct? Those studies, yes. Yeah, and with respect to the physical and mental health outcomes that you say are associated with marriage, you do not believe there have been studies published that compared heterosexual married couples with same-sex married couples, correct? That is correct, to the best of my knowledge. And can you name any tangible benefits that matter that would be available to married couples that are not available for domestic partnership couples in California? Tangible. Big pardon. To the extent the question calls for legal conclusion, the question is whether the witness is uh, aware, is, can identify any tangible benefits that would be available to a married couple that are not available for domestic partnership couple in California. Well, I would say that I, I'm not a legal scholar, so I don't know about the law. I'm vaguely familiar with the fact that there are some differences between domestic partnerships and uh, marital relationships in California. Um, I would say that uh, uh, in terms of tangible benefits, meaning money, uh, inheritance rights, that sort of thing, that um, you don't see the difference there. You see the difference more in the uh, intangible and symbolic meaning of uh, being married uh, and the what may be intangible uh, and yet real consequences of perhaps uh, having a more stable, long, enduring relationship that might be associated with uh, that label of marriage. Right. But for tangible benefits, I'm, I would not be able to name them. Thank you. And you talked a little bit about hate crimes. Uh, are, are hate crimes legal in California? I think uh, crime is illegal in California. <laughs> Correct. And are, are crimes... And are crimes committed on the basis of sexual orientation illegal in California? Yes, they are illegal in California, and in fact, they still continue to occur. And do you believe there is a link between denying, or t between defining marriage as a union of a man and a woman and hate crimes? Well, I think that it's, uh, as I said earlier, when we look at uh, uh, structural stigma, related to sexual orientation, it provides a context in which uh, uh, 
all sorts of things happen, all sorts of behaviors toward people in the stigmatized group. And so I would say that uh, a direct relationship between those two uh, is not uh, empirically established to my knowledge, uh, but that structural stigma as basically creating the atmosphere in which individual enactments of stigma occur, um, that there is potentially a relationship there, yes. Your Honor, I believe I'm concluded, but I just want to quickly consult, if I may, just for a moment. Well, I hope we get good news. <laughs> happy to report that I have no further questions. <laughs> Very well. Mr. Detmar, redirect. Evening, Professor Herrick. <laughs> um, there were a series of questions this morning about uh, the definition of sexual orientation that researchers such as yourself might use. Do you remember those questions? Yes. Um, now, uh, I, I believe you explained that the, um, the different aspects, the three different aspects of sexual orientation will depend upon what the researcher is, um, is researching. Is that correct? Correct. Using the appropriate operational definition would depend on the goals of the research. Um, if I could ask for uh, 17, please. Um, Professor Herrick, if you could turn to tab 12 in the large binder. Uh, if you look at, at page 24. Which, which uh, tab? I'm sorry, tab 12. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is the large binder that, uh, that Mr. Nielsen oh, showed oh, I'm, okay. I'm very sorry. I, I'm just going to be looking at this. I was looking in the wrong binder. Actually, if you want to just look at the screen, that would be sufficient as well. Okay. I've put up the text there. This is from page 24 of tab 12. It says, so what is the correct de de definition of the LGB population? The answer depends on the purpose of the study. A researcher who is interested in risks for HIV AIDS among men who have sex with men, uh, MSMs, might focus on behavioral definitions because behavior affects risk exposure regardless of personal identity. A researcher who is in interested in developmental milestones of gay youth might focus on identity definitions because development of a gay identity is a core task facing the youth. Thus, there is not one answer to the question. It is the researcher's intellectual responsibility to answer this question with reasoned justification. The researcher must define the population on the basis of the study's objectives and its underlying conceptual framework. Uh, is that consistent with uh, your understanding of the technical definition that you've given of sexual orientation? Yes, it's, it's very consistent with that. Are there any other examples you can give of how those three different aspects might be applied? Um, well, I, I, uh, yeah, okay, these got HIV and AIDS in there, developmental milestones. I was talking about, for example, if you want to look at discrimination and its impact, you might look at um, identity definitions. Um, at this hour of the day, I'd be hard-pressed to come up with very many more examples. Fair enough. Um, uh, if I could ask for a demonstrative 18, please. Um, and the question is, Professor Herrick, that that, um, that definitional issue that researchers, social science researchers come up with isn't limited to sexual orientation, is it? It, it also comes up in other contexts. Um, and Stop there before it becomes more compound. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to refer Professor Herrick to the, uh, to the demonstrative, Your Honor. And I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Maybe I'll rephrase the question at, at his honor's suggestion. Um, do social science researchers who are researching issues other than sexual orientation have the same definitional um, issues? Uh, well, yeah, as I believe I stated earlier, and I see it here in, in uh, this, what I guess is a quote from the Dean and Meyer paper, um, you know, when we talk about race, for example, um, this is something 
that uh, can be difficult to define. I mean, some people, for some people, it's very clear, but for other people, uh, they may come from a, rix, a, a mixed racial background, and it's a question of which uh, part of their family or which part of their ancestry they most identify with and label themselves. Their skin color may not be very revealing of them belonging to one race or another. Um, they, might, they may develop an identity as a member of one race or the other race or as a mixed race individual. So no, sexual orientation is certainly not the only area in which things get pretty messy when we're trying to study them. And, and just for the record's sake, the uh, last part of the quotation that I've put up from its tab uh, 13, pages 134 and 135, it says, not surprisingly, these difficulties mirror similar problems that have been recognized and examined relating to the classification of people based on race and ethnicity. Is that what you're referring to, Professor Hart? Yes. That same problem? Yes. Um, and in fact, talking about, we, we spent a lot of time this morning talking about labels that people apply and whether certain labels apply to different groups of, of sexual minorities. Is that right? Correct. Um, would the same label issue come up with respect to racial or ethnic minorities? Well, certainly, if we just look back, e even in our relatively brief uh, history of just, say, the past 100 years, we see that many different terms have been used um, uh, or have come into favor and gone out of favor for describing particular racial or ethnic groups. So, so again, there has been uh, change and, and evolution in that area as well. And similarly, we talked about the identity that gay men and lesbians may have with the gay and lesbian community. It, it, do you remember that, that discussion this morning? It seems like a long time ago, yes. <laughs> um, would those same issues of, of strength of identification with the community be present with, when you're talking about uh, racial groups as well? Uh, yes, and in fact, I think that some of the research on um, lesbian and gay identity has borrowed from previous research on racial and ethnic minority identities as a, a, a starting point, a way to, to try to think about the phenomenon. Now, back to uh, sexual orientation. Um, there was a lot of discussion this morning about the circumstances in which the three different aspects that you'd, that you'd mentioned, um, behavior, attraction, and identity, a lot of discussion about uh, when those three are not in, in uh, th when they don't overlap. Do you remember that testimony? Yeah, when they don't match up, um, yes. Is it your understanding or is it your opinion um, that those three definitions overlap for the vast majority of people? Um, as, as I think I've said several times today, for the vast majority of people, we do see consistency across those three different aspects of sexual orientation. How do you know that? Well, I'll go back again to the Lauman and Gagnon study, which, which is a very good study. Uh, and again, they found that roughly 90% of their participants matched heterosexual on all three of those aspects of, of sexual orientation. And another, I believe it was roughly 2% of the sample matched it on lesbian, gay, and bisexual identity, attraction, and behavior. And then the rest of the sample was where there were, things weren't so neat and, and didn't all match up. Now, um, taking a, this out of the, the research context of, of what research, how researchers define sexual orientation, um, I think you testified earlier that you have asked many people who are not social scientists what their sexual orientation is. Is that correct? Yes, in various surveys and questionnaire studies. Do you have any estimation of how many people you've asked that question of, through surveys or otherwise? Thousands. And is it your opinion that most people um, can answer that question intelligently? It's my opinion that most people can answer that question based not only on my own research, but on other research as well. For example, in the Lauman and Gagnon study, they, uh, they pointed this out as well, that, that most people were able to answer the question. They did have a problem. Some people didn't seem to understand the word heterosexual, but they understood straight. So part of it is asking the question in the right way with the correct language. But yes, most people can answer the question. Now, um, there were a, lo a long series of questions uh, today about, um, well, actually, let me ask you a different question first. Um, there were a series of questions about um, identifying the causes of sexual orientation. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, now, even if you don't know what causes sexual orientation, does that change your opinion that some people are straight, some people are gay, some people are lesbian? And, and some people are bisexual. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't see those two as being uh, related, inherently related to each other. Um, do 
do you find that uh, do you have an opinion about whether most people are consistent in their sexual orientation over time? Um, well, again, I would I would go back to the Lauman and Gagnon study and point out that that it suggests that people tend to be. Um, and as I, I believe I've said, I think if you are a betting person, the best bet is to is that that a person, if you don't know anything else about them, to assume that they probably will be consistent uh, in in the future. It provided that, for example, they are going to actually engage in having sex, um, that that the having sex would be consistent with their their current identity. For some people, that's not how it works, obviously. But uh, I would say that the pattern is that people tend to be consistent. You characterize the proportion of people who are consistent in their sexual orientation. Well, again, I go back to the Laman and Ganyan and say that there it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 92 percent, realizing that there have been instances in the past, especially for lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, where they may have had a period in which they did engage in heterosexual behavior. Um, but especially when we talk about identity and attractions, uh, I think that we see a great deal of consistency there for, for many, many people. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that there is a continuum. Uh, is a, that the, the concept of a continuum is a useful way to think about sexual orientation. Um, why, why do you say that? Well, because the concept of the continuum alerts us to the fact that um, we have to be careful about those categories, that um, there are, in fact, these uh, instances of individuals who don't fit neatly into the category of heterosexual or gay or lesbian. Um, and, and this is where Kinsey's work was, was useful, I think, in sensitizing us to the idea that um, people would have varying uh, levels of sexual attraction and experience toward men or toward women, um, and, and not to simply think in black and white terms. And, and, and I think that gets us closer to reality, so that's very useful. Does, does that uh, concept that you've just described, does it change your, um, your opinion that people do not choose their sexual orientation? Well, some people uh, in my study said that they did feel that they had some degree of choice about their sexual orientation, but they were certainly in the minority. Uh, among gay men only in the national sample, um, only about 5% said that they felt that they had any significant degree of choice about their sexual orientation. For lesbians, it was somewhere between 10 and 20 percent who said they felt that they had some degree of choice, um, and it was somewhat more for bisexuals. So there are some people who say that they perceive uh, a degree of choice about their sexual orientation, but in my research, the majority said they did not. Okay. Um. Now, I want to ask you about some of the specific writings that you were asked to look at earlier today. Okay. Mr. Nielsen referred to a number of studies authored by Professor Diamond. Do you remember those studies? Yes. Um, do uh, the portions of those studies that you read cast any doubt on your opinion that for the, for the vast majority of people, the three different aspects of sexual orientation, uh, attraction, behavior, and identity overlap? Well, I believe that what Lisa Diamond did in her research was um, she looked at the uh, at a sample of people who had a high likelihood of not necessarily overlapping over a period of time and and so I, I don't want to in any way sound like I'm um, denigrating her research I think it's very useful but she also made it very clear in uh, her book and in her various articles that this was not a representative sample that you couldn't use these data to generalize about the entire population but what she was trying to do was to document that this uh, uh, plasticity does occur especially for some women uh, and I think to try to help us to better understand for those women in whom this occurs exactly how it happens. Um, there were also a number of uh, studies that you looked at from Professor Peplau, um, specifically I think uh, in tab 14 of the large binder. I'm not going to ask you to look at it again, um, although I do want to uh, bring up one portion of that, uh, that document. If I could ask uh, 19, please. Um, and let me just read this into the record. This is from page 333 of tab 14, which is defendants 1235. It says, claims about the potential erotic plasticity of women do not mean that most women will actually exhibit change over time. At a young age, many women adopt patterns of heterosexuality that are stable across their lifetime. Some women adopt enduring patterns of same-sex attractions and relationships. 
Is that consistent with your understanding of Professor Peplau's theory uh, regarding um, plasticity? Yes. Is it, is it also under, uh, consistent with your own understanding? Yes. Now, um, are you familiar with a, a um, person named Daniel Robinson, a college professor? Um, I became familiar with his name in the course of this case, but I otherwise was not o aware of him. Um, if I could ask uh, for exhibit, tw uh, sorry, um, demonstrative number 20. This is uh, three lines from prof uh, Professor Robinson's deposition in this case. And just so you know, D Professor Robinson was an expert hired by the defendant interveners, the proponents of Proposition 8. And I am going to object to that, at least to preserve our objection. We withdrew him before the start of trial because he didn't. Sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, I am going to object to this. Uh, we withdrew Professor Robinson before the start of trial. Uh, so I, I want to state my objection. Your Honor, under, uh, he, I, I believe Professor Robinson lives in either England or Maryland and is thus farther than 100 miles from the courthouse, and I believe under FRCP 32 we may use his deposition for any purpose. Very well. Proceed. Um, the testimony I'm, point, I'm uh, asking you to look at, Professor uh, Herrick says, okay, now the question is, now do you believe that sexual orientation is readily subject to change? The answer from Professor Robinson is no. Um, is that consistent with your um, understanding of uh, whether sexual orientation is readily subject to change? I, I would give the same response. Now, um, there were a series of questions that you were asked about uh, sexual orientation change therapy or reparative therapy. Do you remember those? Yes. Um, and I would like to, again, put up a testimony from Professor Robinson. This is number 21, please. Uh, and I'll read it into the record. Uh, question, were you aware at the time you did your report that the APA uh, reached that conclusion? Uh, answer, yes, in fact, I have noted often the refractory nature of homosexuality to any kind of therapeutic intervention, and therefore it wouldn't be at all surprising that enduring changes would not be common. Uh, uh, again, just a continuing objection. Very well. Um, um, deposition was taken in the course of the litigation. No, Your Honor, we're, we're simply reading his a, a deposition of the record, a portion of it. Um, question, and you have fa not found enduring change as a result of therapy to be common? Uh, Professor Robinson's response, no, it is not common. It's not reported to be common. Uh, is that consistent with your understanding of the state of the research on, on sexual orientation change therapy? Yes, it is consistent with my understanding. Um, now, you're also asked several questions about Professor Spitzer's work uh, having to do with this type of therapy. Do you remember yes. that? Um, so let me put up another uh, excerpt from Professor Robinson's deposition. This is 22, please. Uh, the question, okay, uh, so when you make a statement, homosexuality is no more immutable than those identities one takes on in various walks and works of life, and you don't limit that to a group where there's a 93 percent of people deeply religious and 78 percent of people who are on speaking engagements, often at churches, is it appropriate in your view to take a finding in that one limited type of sample and apply it generally as you do in your, in your report? Uh, answer, if my statement about the mutability of homosexuality were tied exclusively to Spitzer's research or anything like it, then indeed it would be an implausible inference. Do you see that? Uh, yes, I see it. Um, do, do you know what uh, is referred to in the question about the 93% of people deeply relig religious and 78% of people who are on speaking engagements, often at churches? Well, um, I'm not sure that I would recall the exact percentages, but I believe that those are the characteristics of the sample that Dr. Spitzer used in his study, um, whom he recruited mainly through um, groups that are uh, supportive of and promoting uh, reparative therapy. Um, and uh, he did comment um, either in the paper or in his, re he, he wrote a later response to some of the criticisms 
uh, or perhaps even in the press, that uh, he was aware of the, that the members of the sample, it was a very, very religious group of people, um, and that they were also very strongly involved in these organizations that promote reparative therapy, and he thought that that was an important qualification on his findings. Um, suggesting that these same findings would not be observed, perhaps, for a group of people who didn't match his sample in terms of their religious uh, beliefs and their uh, activities related to reparative therapy. Now, um, turning to a slightly different uh, topic, um, Mr. Nielsen had you look at Exhibit uh, X912, which is the study by um, John Gonsiorek and James Weinrich, uh, The Definition and Scope of Sexual Orientation. And he asked you questions about a line in that study saying there is little unanimity about the use of the words lesbian and gay as opposed to homosexual. Do you remember that questioning? Uh, sort of, vaguely. Okay. Um, if I could ask for uh, 23, please. This is another um, excerpt from that same document. Uh, it says, we suggest that the term sexual preference is misleading as it assumes conscious or deliberate choice and may trivialize the depth of the psychological processes involved. We recommend the term sexual orientation because most of research findings indicate that homosexual feelings are a basic part of an individual psyche and are established much earlier than conscious choice would indicate. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Now, um, you may recall that uh, some of the deposition testimony from two of the plaintiffs in this case was read to you. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, I want to put up uh, 30, please. And this is trial testimony from our uh, plaintiff, Chris Perry, in this case. She said in this, in this trial, um, she was asked, and tell me what that means in your own words. What does it mean to be a lesbian? The answer is uh, that Ms. Perry gave was, well, for me, what it means is, I have always felt strong attraction and interest in women and formed really close relationships with women, and I have only ever fallen in love with women. And the happiest I feel is in my relationship with Sandy and because I'm in love with her. Is, is that testimony consistent with your understanding of uh, what it means to be a lesbian? Um, well, it, it seems to uh, have all of those elements of attraction and desire as well as uh, uh, apparently behavior and, and the relationship and, and the self-labeling. So, yes, I would say that this is consistent with what I was saying about uh, uh, what constitutes sexual orientation in general and, in this case, lesbianism. And I'm going to put up some more of uh, Ms. Perry's trial testimony. 31, please. Um, she was asked, in this trial, do you feel that in the past you could have developed that same kind of bond with a man? Uh, Ms. Perry's answer was, I was unable to do that. As I, as I said, grew up in Bakersfield, California, and it was in the 70s and 80s. And all of my friends, as we were getting older and they were beginning to date, became more and more interested in boys. And I recognized that that was something that would have, would have been the best thing for me to do if I could. And I did date a few boys because it was, it did make life easier, you know. Then I would have a date to go to the prom, too, or I could go to a party, too. But as I got a little bit older, it became clear to me that I didn't feel the same way my friends did about boys and that there was something different about me. Is that consistent with your understanding of um, the coming out process? Well, yeah, and I think it's consistent with, with um, some of what I said earlier about um, the idea that um, many lesbians and gay men at some point in their lives, uh, especially during adolescence or young adulthood, um, often will um, try to uh, have a relationship with someone who's of the other sex uh, and that this may in include sexual contact as well. But I think that what this quote suggests is that she may have tried to do that, but it, it just didn't work for her. Uh, and she recognized that her attractions were to women. I have, I have one more uh, excerpt from Ms. Perry's testimony in this trial. Uh, 32, please. Um, Ms. Perry was asked, do you feel that you were born with those feelings, with, these, with that kind of sexual orientation? Her answer was, yes, I do. Question, do you feel it could change in the future? Do you have a sense that it might somehow change? Her answer was, I'm 45 years old. I don't think so. 
Um, is that testimony consistent with your understanding of the um, of the uh, constancy of sexual orientation? Um, yeah, with in terms of the constancy, I, I would say that you know the question about whether one is born with feelings. This this is something we don't know. There, one can have that subjective sense. This doesn't address the question of really what are the origins of sexual orientation. But the idea of believing that this is a constant in one's life, and I think it, it's reasonable to expect that by the age of 45, when one is in a, a committed relationship, one probably does have a pretty good sense of the constancy of, of where their life is likely to go in the future. Uh, just a couple more questions. Um, and this goes to uh, um, defining uh, gay men and lesbians. Uh, if two women uh, want to marry each other, is, is it a reasonable assumption that they are lesbians? Uh, I, I think it's a reasonable assumption, yes. And if two men want to marry each other, is it a reasonable assumption that they're gay? Uh, yes. Questions, Your Honor? Very well. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Herrick. I think you uh, win the Long Distance Award. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. Uh, with respect to the Robinson deposition, Mr. Nielsen, you can, of course, offer excerpts under 32A6 if you wish to do so. If you can get those in on Monday, that would be fine. And um, let's see, Mr. Boutros, you said you had about 90 minutes. Yes, Your Honor. Um, up, up. Yeah, it, I gather that you're prepared to do that on Monday morning? We'll be prepared first thing Monday morning, Your Honor. That means the def – and then – with the exception of perhaps uh, organizing exhibits and so forth, the plaintiffs will rest. Exactly. Right. Then uh, who's the first witness we're going to hear on the other side? Your Honor, we're not sure who will be first, but it'll either be uh, Dr. Ken Miller or Mr. David Blankenhorn. Very well. Uh, and uh, might be helpful if you could give the other side an idea. Usually that's... Is it, or are they both going to testify on Monday and we'll get all of their testimony completed? Well, we will, we will identify uh, 48 hours beforehand which one it will be, and uh, we honestly just haven't decided yet, but we, we, will, hey, well, we will do so uh, tomorrow morning. Have a nice weekend, I guess, is the comment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Boyce, you're no, tomorrow uh, gesturing. Morning. Uh, tomorrow morning, yeah. <laughs> I actually thought that the um, agreement was that for the first witnesses we would have more time, which is what we gave them. Um, so I thought actually we were going to get more than 48 hours notice of their first witness, but it will be what it will be. Oh. Do I understand you're, you're planning presently only on two witnesses? Two witnesses, Your Honor, two expert witnesses. We uh, may well call another witness uh, primarily for the purpose of uh, authenticating documents. Okay, was that one of the one of the uh, uh, proponents? Uh, no, not one of the proponents. <laughs> well, um, I guess on the plaintiff's team, you better be ready for both of those uh, witnesses, Young and uh, no, not Young, uh, Miller, Dr. Miller, and, Miller, and um, Blankenhorn. Blankenhorn, yes. I say I. I think right. we will resolve that uh, this evening and let our friends for the plaintiffs know tomorrow morning. All right. Well, have a pleasant weekend, everybody. Anything further? <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Good.